Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Double AS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is part of the great stuff. This is the Double AS Journal Author Series. And I am very happy to have Noah Tushow and Jason Wright with us today. Hello, Noah. Hello, Jason. Hello. Hi, good to be here. Uh, yeah, so it is October 17th of 2024 as we record this, and um, we're actually cooling down in Phoenix. So we were actually sub-70 this morning, so degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we'll still warm up to about 100 or so in the day, but it is actually cooling down post-equinox, so very cool. Uh, and Noah, what is what is your geolocation? Where are you at? Uh, I'm here in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. I work at NASA Goddard, so I'm uh, around 20-minute commute from NASA. Very cool. Are the leaves turning color? Uh, they are, but oh, it's still right. pretty warm and stuff. It was like, it was like 80 degrees last weekend. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so, but it's colder now and stuff, but it's been kind of oscillating in terms of temperatures between summer and fall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Transition point. And Jason, where's your geolocation? Where are you at? Uh, I'm here at the University Park campus of Penn State in State College, Ooh. Pennsylvania. Cool. And um, the leaves have definitely been turning here. Uh, we've got lots of yellow now. Um, mm. really, really good leaves everywhere around here. I'm going to be down in Green Bank in a couple of weeks. Oh, nice! Uh, and that drive with my uh, with my class is always pretty amazing this time of year. So I'm really looking forward to all of that. And yeah, it's definitely gotten cold. We've had some mornings down in the 40s and high 30s, and I've almost convinced my kids to start putting on sweaters on the way to school. <laughs> That's so cool. You take a class down to to uh, Green Bank. How many how many do you do that with? Is that like 30 or something? Like um, that? So I teach um, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence as an mm -hmm. undergraduate course and a graduate course on alternating falls. And so this fall, we have eight students in the graduate course uh, from across the university. They are astrobiology dual title PhD students. So actually, only nice. two of them are astronomers. Cool. Um, so it'll be a, just one van this time, but when the undergraduate course comes around, uh, we can fill the room with, you know, mid twenties, plus we get some extra drivers and, and members of my group. So then we can take two, two vans down, but it's always a good time and a long drive, but uh, it's well worth it. Well worth we're it. Much contact in the Drake lounge. Uh, <laughs> Very cool. Very so cool. Okay, uh, and um, Noah, what do you like to do for research? Um, so my research is split into two different things. Uh, uh, so this uh, research note is on one topic, which is I'm interested in the long-term habitability of exoplanets. Okay. So I'm interested in how host star evolution affects planetary evolution. Okay. And then the second thing which I'm doing is preparing for the Habba Worlds Observatory. Oh. So, so, so I focus primarily on the uh, target stars that HWO that, that that the Habitable Worlds Observatory HWO will look at. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I've recently assembled a preliminary input catalog for HWO. Ooh. Mm -hmm. And we're using that in the current HWO working groups to better define different tiers of targets and to, and to find uh like what information we need for each class of targets. So there's like the best characterized, like 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 the optimal targets for HWO, and then like the targets that an observatory might look at. And then the stuff that like a full yield calculation would need and stuff because a yield calculation would would, would require all essentially every target that, that HWO would possibly want to look at yeah. and stuff to narrow it down to 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 the optimal targets. Very cool. Very cool. And Jason, what do you like to do for research? I like to do everything for research. <laughs> um, my bread and butter research for most of my career has been precise radial velocities of yes. stars to discover exoplanets. Yes. Um I've always been a stellar astrophysicist interested in stars, stellar evolution, stellar magnetic activity. Um, when Noah was here at Penn State doing his PhD, we were using MESA uh, to explore these habitable histories of, cool. of exoplanets. Um, lately, I've gotten much more into the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I'm the director of the Penn State Extraterrestrial Intelligence Center here, and we take a pretty broad view of it. And so that includes the theory. It includes radio. We're partners with the Allen Telescope Array. It includes looking at atmospheric technosignatures. And I'm writing a textbook on all of that. So my my other writing has kind of uh, a lot of that stuff's been backburnered while I try and finish. There off you go. Stuff. There you go. Well, it'll be really cool to see your book come out. It'll be very nice. Nice. And that is going to bring us to this very awesome research note. It's a research note of the AAS. It is open access. It's the open access era, people. You can go grab a copy for free. Go get one. HZ Evolution, a 
package to calculate habitable histories. And Noah and Jason, take us away. Mm -hmm. So, so this is a Python package which I developed. Actually, it was based off of a tool that I developed for myself during my PhD thesis. I did my PhD thesis on essentially uh, like the long-term habitability of exoplanets, and this package was a tool I made for myself, which I thought might be useful for the astronomical community. So we've made mm -hmm. it publicly available and also expanded upon it, made it more user-friendly and more intuitive to use. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And so essentially what this package does is if you know the planet's uh, current effective flux and also the uh, fundamental properties of the host star, such as the mass, age, and metallicity, this okay. can tell you the duration that the planet spends in the habitable zone. And it can okay. also tell you, tell you the duration that it might have spent by, 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 like before entering the habitable zone, either interior or exterior. Okay. So when we think about the habitable zone, we often think of it as this, you know, this static region and a planet's in it or out of it. Yeah. Or perhaps if we think about a planet having some eccentricity, we think, oh, maybe it comes in and out in an orbit. Right. But one thing we don't think about as often is how the host star evolves with time. Mm. And so it's entirely possible, even without the planet doing any migration, right. for it to have formed inside the habitable zone Okay. And then um, have the habitable zone move in and make it habitable, or the other way, it might have formed outside the habitable zone. And as the star evolves and gets more luminous, the habitable zone can move out and catch it. Cool. So it's important for us to think about this when we think about habitable zone planets, because a planet that has not spent all of its life with a volatile uh, with volatiles yes. in the habitable zone might have a very different prospect for life and habitability. For cool. instance, if it's outside the habitable zone, it might be completely icy and glaciated. Mm -hmm. And then as the habitable zone moves outwards, as the star gets brighter, you would think, oh, it will get warmer and the ice will melt, but ice is highly reflective. Yes. Mm -hmm. That high albedo, it might never thaw out until it is so warm that it goes straight to steam. And so these, you know, that's just an outline, a very rough possibility. So mm -hmm. uh, what Noah's done, uh, is created a general tool. So for any planet and any host star, we can explore whether a planet has been continuously habitable or what we call belatedly habitable, meaning that it's at some point it became habitable, but it hasn't always been that way. Okay, okay, I'm with you. Very good. Um, well, let's just go through one and, and I'll ask maybe some questions once I get there. So very cool. Okay, so what does it actually do? How does it do this? So it essentially runs alongside a stellar model. So you bring your own stellar model, your favorite stellar model, like Mesa or like like any stellar model that you want and stuff. But it but it can run alongside your stellar model and um and essentially what it does is it calculates the installation history of the planet and then also the duration that it spends in the habitable zone and outside the habitable zone. Okay. And that can be done fairly easily if you have a stellar evolutionary track that provides you with the luminosity and temperature evolution of the host star. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so we cool. calculate this quantity, which I'm calling the habitable duration, which mm -hmm. is a, given by a tau and stuff, which is the duration that the planet spends in the habitable zone uh, from, from, from a given starting point up until the current day. Cool. Very so cool. how you define the starting point might differ depending on your, 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 your studies. So, I mean, we've typically uh, used a, uh, uh, a starting point of maybe like fifty, like 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 fifty million years to represent a potential time scale for the for the delivery of volatiles, but but realistically, this tool can be uh, used without any assumptions about that. Also, yeah, good, good. Let's so if if we are thinking specifically about biosignatures and whether you know what HWO will be able to reveal about biosignatures through a population of habitable zone terrestrial planets. We want to interpret that in terms of how long it would have taken biosignatures to arise. We know on Earth, the strongest biosignatures formed more recently, and that early Earth, although it had life, might have been very challenging to identify as an inhabited planet. So we imagine, I think most of us implicitly, that the longer a planet has been along, around, the more likely it is to host biosignatures. Mm -hmm. So the habitable duration that NOAA has defined is, is the quantification of that. If you have a particular planet, this is how long it's been in the habitable zone. And we might might want to favor planets with ha longer habitable durations versus ones that are only very recently Short. Yeah. habitable. Now, a big thing is when you start the clock, 
because stars do a lot of pre-made sequence evolution. The habitable zone moves around a lot then, but there aren't any planets yet. Or yeah. if there are, they haven't finished acquiring the volatiles we expect are necessary for life. Okay. And so one thing NOAA's done with this code is allowed the user to specify that, that start time because we don't know. Okay. But that then it's parameterized. So someone might say, you know, I'm only interested in how long since 50 million years after the zero point in these evolutionary tracks, for instance. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh... I should also mention something that, that like we covered a little bit earlier in like the paper, but I forgot to mention stuff, but but that's uh, uh, knowing the installation history of a planet is actually very important in understanding the planet's climate evolution and stuff. So like, yeah. so planetary climate is very complicated and depends on all these different factors like the plant's geophysical evolution, it's a uh, atmospheric evolution, all, all, all of these like chemistry models. Yeah. But the one factor that we actually understand pretty well about uh, uh, these planets is the evolution of their host stars. Mm -hmm. At least the evolution of the host star on the, on, 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 on the main sequence. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And so, so that's one of the key drivers of, of climate evolution as one that we can actually parameterize very well, even if you don't know that much about the planet. Yeah. So we can imagine yeah. it when HWO is finding these planets and people start inevitably modeling their climates, this code will be ready to deliver the installation history onto those uh, into those models uh, so that these other things that we won't know until we discover the planets, like their mass and surface gravity and atmospheric composition, those can go in later. Cool. And remind me, what is the, uh, what is the launch date or first light of HWO? Uh, it's pretty distant future. I think it's probably actually, it, it, it's probably like the 2040s. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I should be a young person by then, so it'll be great. But realistically, this could be a, this could be applied to any detected exoplanets, not just uh, HWO planets. We, yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. We, we we were just thinking about the applications for HWO since I've been doing a lot of research relating to HWO precursor science. Cool. Very good. So let's do an example. Mm-hmm. 62F, Kepler 62F. Okay. So this example case is not necessarily uh, focused on actually providing uh, the, the precise uh, properties of this planet, but rather using this as an example planet to show the application of this uh, Python package. Right. Very cool. And, and we should mention it is open access. You can go get it on Zenodo, people. Go grab it. Right. And so Noah was saying you bring your own stellar model to it, but one of the things he's done is provide... Um, access to the MIST models, these, oh, these, okay. these um, MESA uh -huh. isochrones. Um, so you don't, you know, the, the code, you should be able to run it entirely, you know, as is, just you put in what you think the host star is, you put in the, the separation to the planet, and it will do the rest. But if you want to say, I want to use a different um, habitable zone definition uh, than right. the one's default, or I want to use a different set of isochrones, um, it, allow, it has the hooks for you to make those decisions. Very cool. Very cool. So, Options are always why better. did you pick Kepler 62F? I picked Kepler 62F because it is a planet that's roughly Earth-sized in the habitable zone of a late G or early K star. Mm. And it was kind of like, uh, uh, I mean, we always use the example of like the sun and stuff, but I wanted to use an example of like an actual uh, exoplanet that, that that people have discovered that, that this tool might be a good uh, uh, analogy for. Ooh. Yes, yes, very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Oh, and I think it's worthwhile uh, pointing out, you can incorporate that to an MCMC if you want. Oh yeah, so I can actually explain a little bit more about, so like the MIST model grid and like isochrone grids in general have like a tabulated uh, list of stellar properties as a function of all these host star properties such as uh, a, 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 like a multidimensional table of, of stellar properties as a function of host star properties like mass, age, and mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, uh, metallicity, as long as they use a proxy for age, uh, equivalent evolutionary phase. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But but essentially, what we're doing with our uh, uh, package is we're essentially saying that we can essentially make our own isochrone grid with these uh, quantities that we're interested in. Although we add an extra dimension for the installation, so 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 the plant's effective installation. So we essentially have a four-dimensional grid of calculated. Uh, 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 Duration spent in the habitable zone and outside the habitable zone. Nice. Okay. And for any given planet around any star where, where, where we know the host star properties, we can calculate that very quickly using interpolation stuff. Yep. So, so the model grid itself might take around maybe uh, 15 minutes to calculate and stuff. But after you run it once and stuff, then you can calculate 
the hop rotation in like fractions of a second. Nice. Right. So these MCMC methods, of course, are going to make, you know, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of calls. And you don't want to be interpolating or you don't want to be generating these grids fresh with each call. Right. So right. Uh, code when you run it, there is this, if it's on your laptop or something, there's this maybe 15 minutes where it does all of the crunching and saving the files. But but then you're done and the MCMC chain can just hop through these these 4D grids very quickly. Very nice. Very cool. And I can just run alongside like Stellar model fitting, like as you fit an isochrone with MCMC methods, you can just get the chain of the, these values and stuff using this package at, essentially at the same time. Nice, very good, very good. Uh, okay, habitable history. What do we have here? So these are two plots showing essentially the same information, but in different uh, axes. So, so this is showing the evolution of Kepler-62f in terms of its position, in terms of its position in the habitable zone, and also in terms of the location of a tabular zone. So, 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 one of these plots is in flux units. The other one is in distance units. Mm -hmm. So here okay. we're saying that that on the uh, uh, right plot, we're showing that the planet stays in the same location, but one can see that the habitable zone is essentially moving in and out because the star is dimming on the pre-main sequence, then gradually increasing right. on the main sequence. Okay. Mm -hmm. So is it is it always? Let me just ask: is is the planet assumed to always be in a circular? Uh, yeah. Currently, this is just assuming like a circular orbit at a fixed uh, sine major axis. Okay. Although this tool could potentially handle a uh, 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 a planetary migration if you had a function for say how the uh, sine major axis of the planet changes as a function of time. Okay. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is and then this and then this uh, uh, left plot. Is showing essentially a normalized habitable zone position in terms of flux units. Okay. The reason why it's normalized rather than just using the fluxes is because for slightly different uh, stellar values in the MCMC chain, it kind of messes up the location of the uh, habitable zone in terms of every every point in the MCMC MC chain has a slightly different habitable zone. So, right. so so normalizing it like this gives you a quantitative sense about where in the habitable zone the planet is without having to to uh, 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 worry about the minutia of of the individual points in the chain. Right, right. So what we're seeing yep. here at the very early times uh, is, as Noah said, the the approach to the main sequence of of the star, uh, which is quite luminous on its way to the main sequence, and mm -hmm. then the little wiggle there where it goes up and then and comes down. That's the ignition of hydrogen in the core, and then oh, yes, 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 very settles cool. onto the main sequence. So the zero point here is just the zero point of the grids. Yeah. And so the user can specify at what time in this, you know, development, they want to say, this is where I want to start habitability from. And presumably that would correspond to when you think the volatiles show up on the surface through whatever mechanism you'd like to invoke there. But for the case of a planet that somehow was there from the very beginning, just for illustrative purposes, okay. you can see the habitable history there um, and how it begins at a few million years mm -hmm. and how and uh, up to some present day. Yes. But what's really neat about what Noah's done is that we don't actually know the age of the star. Ages for stars are hard. Mm -hmm. And so we also don't exactly know its mass. We, we know you know we know its approximate uh, present day surface metallicity. Metallicity, yeah. Um, and so what you see there in the gray are all of the MCMC steps. Uh -huh. So these are these are all of the habitable histories that are you know admitted by the uncertainties in the stellar model. Right. Okay. Good. So even if the current day stellar age isn't well constrained. One can constrain this quantity t int very very well. You 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 can see the spread of values around around the intersect between the uh, black curve and the uh, dotted green curve in mm -hmm. the black plot. And that is showing uh, uh, that there's very low uncertainty in, in, in the location that I intersect. Okay. Right. Whereas the uncertainty in the habitable duration is quite large because where that, that arrow marked by tau mm -hmm. ends on the right is different for different steps in the MCMC chain. And that's just reflecting sure. our uncertainty in the age of the star. If the star is, you know, 5 billion versus 6 billion years old, that's going to change the habitable duration. In this particular case for um, for 62F, mm -hmm. it essentially spends all of its time uh, since the planet formed in the habitable zone. And that, and 
the uncertainties on the the properties of the star are tight enough that that's a firm conclusion. None of these draws ever found the the planet not in the habitable zone. So this is a firmly habitable zone planet, uh, presuming that it hasn't undergone any migration. Right. Those uh, ranges are pretty tight here on these uh, great contours. Uh, and just remind me, your folks, what the two two different ones here on the right are? Oh, that's the inner and outer habitable zone boundaries. Got you. Thank you. So there's an inner boundary and outer boundary, and the hmm. planet is between those for the vast majority of, the, of its history. Okay. And actually, the one period where it's not in it is probably before it actually formed, so we don't necessarily need to consider that when, 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 when we're looking at the habitable history of a planet. Yeah. But if you had a, uh, say, a planet around a lower mass star, like an M dwarf, you might yeah. actually consider that because an M dwarf could, could, could spend upwards of like 100 million years dimming onto the pre-main sequence. Right. So I, I think Trappist One is a good example of like a system which has ha, which has an evolutionary history such that the planets would have been subject to intense insulations earlier in their history, but now are currently in the habitable zone. Okay. Conversely, mm -hmm. um, if you find planets around evolved stars, um, stars that maybe are still technically near the main sequence, but are almost subgiants or even subgiants. Okay. And tracking these curves that you see here into the future, you'll see on the right hand plot. Um, you'll see the habitable zone move up again and away from the star. And you the, and you'll yeah. see, you know, you can see it's starting here a little for some of the models, but, you know, for older older stars, uh, yeah. you'll see it, it'll curve much farther up. And, you know, we know that as the sun evolves, planets like the Earth will, um, uh, you know, get hotter and hotter and eventually no longer be in the habitable zone. And so, um, especially for those, I think it'll be very useful to know what the probability is that a given planet in the habitable zone of a very old star has, you know, is is still there, or maybe it's already gone on to the inside, or maybe it's on the outside, and the right. only reason it's yes. in the habitable zone is the recent yes. evolution of the star, and yeah. it's actually only been in that zone for who knows, you know, 500 million years or something. Mars, let's say. <laughs> right. <laughs> very cool. Very good. And yeah, I should also mention that in, in, in this example, we have a lower mass star, so it doesn't evolve as quickly on the main sequence as, say, a star like the Sun, which has increased by around like maybe 30% in luminosity over the course of its main sequence evolution from from the pre-main sequence up until the current day. Yes. Or, 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 or from, the, from the zero main sequence, zero age main sequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very nice. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. And this is also... Uh, 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 if you look at the values we 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 report here for for tau, which is the habitable duration, and also uh, uh, scroll up a little bit. Yeah, oh, I'm just yeah, yeah. 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 So mm -hmm. like, if, if you look at the uncertainties and the values that we report for tau, which is essentially the duration spent in the habitable zone, versus t int, which is the duration spent interior to the habitable zone, one can see that we're much more confident about these time spent interior to the habitable zone. Mm -hmm. And actually, I didn't include it in this research note, but we've done some past past research, which might be published in the future okay. uh, paper, which is showing that that okay. the time spent into the habitable zone is very dependent on the mass of the star rather than the age of the star. Mm -hmm. So 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 it's essentially, essentially dependent on your pre-main sequence model, which is more sensitive to to to, to your stellar mass and metallicity rather than knowing the current day age of the star. Right. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. So we know the mass of the star pretty well and it can be pretty well constrained. So the duration spent interior to the habitable zone can also be well constrained. Nice. Whereas the uh, uh, duration spent in the habitable zone is about as well constrained as the age is. Typically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're hopeful that as more and more planets in or possibly in or near the habitable zones of host stars get discovered, especially those that we think that we're going to target with HWO in the future. Right. Um, this can become something anybody can use to just, you know, include in their papers um, to, to show, yes, it's firmly a habitable zone planet nice. or, or it's belatedly habitable or it might be or whatever, and really quantify right. uh, probability or the, the, the amount of time it's spent in the habitable zone. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, for tricky cases like Trappist-1 that might not quite be on the grid and stuff, uh, I know, you know, Noah can go backstage and, and fix things for custom custom jobs that might not work <laughs> right, out of the, right out of the box as well. Awesome. For Trappist-1, I would probably run a Mesa model rather than relying on the MIST grids and stuff because, uh, yeah. 
but it, but it might be a bit more difficult to get uncertainties for Trappist one predictions because you don't have a a model grid that 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 spans right the boundary between uh, star and round dwarf and stuff. That's kind of a a well, well I think there are model grids, but 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 I haven't used them yet. Yeah, we would probably want to have Noah run a custom Mesa job for that case. Yeah. We'll come back to that point here in a second. Very good. Very cool. Okay. Nice. Very good. Plus it gives you, uh, you know, is this a good follow-up target, right? If you wanted to like characterize the atmosphere um, because it was in the habitable zone long enough and this kind of thing. So yeah. yeah. Right. It's a nice Another thing. way to think of it is that um, this will help us test our models of the habitable zone. When we find planets that are belatedly habitable, oh. continuously habitable, yeah. or the outer edge of the zone and the inner edge of the zone, we mm -hmm. might expect, you know, HWO to find different levels of, you know, glaciation or different albedos or different kinds of atmospheres. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is this gives us, you know, a, a real a, a real proper um, uh, handle habitable history with pro uncertainties. Mm -hmm. on, you know, on what kind of planet you're looking at, uh, instead of just yes, it's in the habitable zone. What else would you need to know? Which is and one thing which I should also mention, based on relevance for HWO, is that the, this class of planets that are bladely habitable planets that originate from outside the habitable zone are likely pretty high albedo uh, reflective objects, and they might be preferentially observed by HWO. So HWO might be biased towards Ooh, yeah, because they're both farther from their host stars in terms of angular separation, and yeah. also apparently brighter because they're more reflective. Mm -hmm. so, so, so if these planets aren't habitable, then we'd want to know that so that we don't find 25 like 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 so 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 we don't find 25 earth-sized planets in the habitable zone but almost all of them belong to this class of ambiguously habitable planets yeah right cool very good this is an awesome little tool this is great very very cool very nice i encourage you to go grab a copy people go get one play with it <laughs> all righty Noah, Jason, I want to thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely research note and your software instrument. Very cool. Thanks for giving me a chance to introduce it. Sure. Yeah, it's been our pleasure. And it's been a lot of fun watching this uh, project of Is That Planet Habitable turn into something the whole community can use. Yeah. Yeah. And so you kind of touched on it a little bit there. Um, and so let me push on a little bit uh, on uh, where do you think we go from here, given the published article and the published tool? We already mentioned an example of, of uh, you know, perhaps needing a new grid for TRAPPIST-1. Can one envision a case where one has a sufficiently dense and wide library to cover all cases? Uh, and then there was motion of the planet, accounting for the eccentricity, perhaps, of a planet. And so just sort of next steps. Where do you think we go from here um, with the tool? I was thinking it might be interesting to couple this tool with uh, 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 like atmospheric mass loss uh, uh, tools, yeah. like the tools that, that 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 essentially relate the effect of insulation that a star has to the mass loss of a planet. So so you could potentially apply this to Trappist and figure out the amount of mass loss you might expect for given atmospheric initial states. Cool. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Atmospheric escape and all and other mechanisms. Yes. Oh, very and, cool. and based on the way it's written, I think it would be very straightforward for someone to introduce whatever complications they want. You know, for an eccentric planet, you know, you want some sort of, you know, um, appropriately weighted distance so that the installations that you're calculating are, you know, annual averages and that that's or appropriate. Double. Yeah. Um, we also fooled around a little while with trying to extend it to some non-standard cases like um, giant star evolution. But then when, right. when stars start getting brighter and dimmer and then white dwarf, some of these definitions become ambiguous because you have, might have multiple habitable periods Period. for planets and presumably they're migrating. So it still so, works in those cases, but 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 the epochs in which like you're you're you you have a habitable duration might be a much shorter duration like 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 you might have multiple epochs of habitability. Right. So I guess a future uh Thing that we would like to do is potentially be able to uh, uh, list all those as separate entries yes. in the array rather than just yes. listing the yes. most recent ones. And you may sum them up if you like or whatever you want to do with it. But yeah, uh, that's right. But just being able to say habitability. <laughs> right. I mean, but just being able to plot the luminosity and effective temperature of of a star with time with the appropriate error bars on it, I think, is just really valuable, and it's just yes. giving it to you. Yes, absolutely. Very cool. Well, it'll be really fun to see this um, 
tool develop over the next couple of years as people start using it and getting it out there and start making some um, quantitative arguments on habitable zones. So it'll be very cool. Very nice. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your habitable astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.